Hey guys, Carlo Filippo in here, your muscle chef, ready to talk to you about this guy, the chicken pound. What do we do with the chicken pound? We prepare grilled chicken in different flavors, six to be exact. If you're serious about bodybuilding and you meal prep, don't go anywhere else. This is the company for you. RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave. Your 30-minute weekly question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the table. As we now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, of course, the Arnold Classic, which seems to be quite a bit away. We're only looking at about, what, eight weeks away. And some big news this week, Ruli Winkler uh, confirming to RX Muscle that he is not going to be at the Arnold Classic. He will not be at the Arnold Australia. You have a video coming out shortly as far as your reaction to the news. But if you want to give the audience a little primer as far as your initial thoughts to really Winkler withdrawing from the Arnold Classic. Yeah, you know, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think that it's very hard a lot of times for these top bodybuilders who are in contention to win these big shows to sit these out. Because they figure, well, it's a, it's a chance to make money, it's a chance to win a title, it's a chance to get momentum. I'm expected to do it. Uh, you know, my sponsors want me to do it. And the Arnold and the Olympia are the two biggest shows of the year. So I think that, you know, he felt pressure to do it, and that's probably why he put his name on the list. And, you know, now he's, he's you know, he realized, wait a minute here. You know, I have had two poor showings in 2019. I wasn't my best whether it be due to injuries or the fact that he just couldn't get it together, you know, he was mentally a little burnt out, I don't know. So he obviously sat down with his team and they said, look, you know, he, said, I, I, he must have felt like I can't be my best for this show. And if I show up at, at less than my best again, people are going to start to push me off to the side as one of those guys that has, is going downhill. So I think it was good. Let him take a little more time, rest his body up. The big guys, their bodies take a big beating when, when, you, when you put it through a rig rigorous uh, contest prep season. Let him rest up, spend some time with his family, um, and then, you know, when he starts feeling like, you know, I miss it, that's the time to go back and start dieting because that's when you're going to get the best results. When you're pushing yourself and you don't really feel like doing it and you don't really, then that's not the right time. So I think it was a smart move on his part. I always, you know, I always said to myself, if I was a bodybuilder, and I always was a guy who can get in shape, you know, real easy, I would have a hard time as a pro missing that Arnold in, in Olympia every year. Yet I see guys sit the Arnold out in hopes to put, you know, the Olympia, um, you know, their best fo foot forward for the Olympia. And I, and I take my hat off to them because it is tough to give up those big shows. You know, not many people can win both shows in, in the same year. It hasn't happened that much. You know, Brandon Curry doing it in 2019 was the first time it's been done in a really long time. So, good move on Ruley's part. We're going to obviously have to see him before the Olympia, whether he's going to wait till the very end like Tampa, or we might see him at the New York Pro, which I think would be a better idea. Um, it's anyone's guess right now. I guess only Ruley really knows what's going to happen. And Dave, a quick word. You have your uh, Secrets to Become a Die Guru course coming up as well if you want to give the audience a little bit more information. Yeah, that's going to be on uh, Saturday, January 25th at Cape Coral, Florida, right here in my offices. And we do the Secrets to Becoming a Die Guru course where I teach everyone everything there is to know about diet, supplementation, performance dancing, drugs, how to write diets for men and women, and everything you could possibly imagine in 10 hours. Take you guys out to lunch. You get some freebies we give out here. It's a fun day, and it's nice and warm here in Florida. It's going to be 88 degrees, actually, tomorrow. So anyone who's going to be coming down for that course is going to have a great time. And we always pack out the, the winter courses because everyone wants to get out of the, 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 the wintry uh, north. But we only have two seats left, possibly a third, if I, if I open it up for another person. So you got to sign up as quickly as possible on DavePalumbo.com. Don't wait. I know I always get sign-ups at the last minute. But don't wait because if we, if we fill the class up, then, I, then there's nothing I could do. Because I, I like to keep the classes small so it's an intimate learning experience. So uh, once again, DavePalumbo.com and go sign up over there. Let's get to the questions. The first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, Dave, at 40 years old and fairly lean, is it worth for me to include cardio in my routine? If so, what do you suggest and what benefit would I find? Here's my take on cardio. I started doing cardio for a while. When I stopped, you know, uh, 
you know, doing crazy workouts and stuff like that. I said, well, I better do some cardio for my heart, right? And the truth is that the cardio I was doing, I was outside cycling, was, was screwing my heart up. <laughs> it was making my, it was lowering my heart rate so much that my, my, my heart was beating irregularly. So um, my, here's my idea. I think most people do cardio not for the cardiovascular effect of it. They do it because they don't want to store body fat or they want to be leaner. So if you tend to be a guy who puts on body fat relatively easy, it's probably a good idea to do three days, four days a week of some cardio, you know, for 20, 30 minutes. If, however, you're like someone like me who has a very fast metabolism, okay, I'm already running around all day chasing my kids and doing all kinds of stuff. I want to weight train a little bit, and I've been training, weight training at night in my house uh, four or five days a week. It doesn't pay for me to do cardio. I don't need it. I don't think that cardio is necessarily doing anything better for me. Unless, like I said, I got on a, on a bike and went outside cycling at a cardiovascular rate. And even that, I think at my age, over 50, I don't think it's necessary. I really don't. I, don't, I think as long as you're active and you're not sitting on the couch all day and you are weight training, I don't think cardio is important unless you have a weight problem where you're overweight. So it's a personal decision for me. It's not worth me expending the extra whatever it is, hour and a half for doing you know, 30 minutes three times a week of cardio because I don't need it. If you need it, do it. If you don't, you're gonna, I feel way more energized not doing cardio. When I do cardio, I gotta sleep more. I got news for you. When I train it with heavier weights, I need to sleep more. I absolutely see a correlation. I never saw it before because I was always training, you know, five days a week, balls to the wall. Now that I, I don't do that anymore, I notice when I don't train as much, I don't need to sleep as much and I don't need to eat as much. And when I do train, okay, I'm, o- I'm always, I need a nap midday, I, in the middle of the day, because I'm exhausted, because my body requires more sleep. So I think the more you tax your body, the, you have to make sure that you're gonna eat more, number one, and that you're gonna rest more. And if you can't do that, then you, you have to pick your, you know, you have to pick which is more important. To me, weight training is more important than cardio, because I wanna maintain lean body mass, which is gonna keep me stronger as I get older. Okay. Let's go. A uh, second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, Dave, can Mastron be used productively as HRT? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Because testosterone, when we measure, and you can't really separate this, but when we measure how anabolic it is compared to how androgenic it is, okay, and the, an- the androgenic component of a steroid is the masculinizing effect of the steroid, okay? The glycogen, when we talk about androgenic components, how much it can load glycogen, the aggression aspect of it, um, the, the male sex characteristic development potential of it, okay? If there was no androgenic component of testosterone, boys wouldn't turn into men. In other words, if boys just had anivar in their system or masteron in their system, okay, uh, when they were, as they're aging through uh, puberty, they wouldn't go through puberty. So you need that androgenic component of the testosterone. So the problem with, 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 with the Masteron is it doesn't have that. So if you were to just take Masteron, and let's say your body wasn't producing any of its own testosterone, you probably wouldn't have that much of a sex drive. You wouldn't be that driven in the gym. You'd lose that, that, that androgenic you know, component of the drug. And to me, that's not good for hormone replacement. It's good to add to testosterone because the testosterone plus the anabolic aspects of Masteron kind of augment each other. But as a standalone, the only thing I'm going to do, I would say no. Matter of fact, the first cycle I ever did was Prima Bolin and Winstrel. And while I put on some decent size from it and I looked good on it, my sex drive wasn't great. Because I think what it did was it blunted my natural testosterone production a little bit and it overwhelmed it with more anabolic and without that androgenic component, because there is none really in, in Prima Bolin and Winstrel. And, and that's why my sex drive wasn't that great. When I did my second cycle, which involved testosterone, my sex drive was through the roof. So I don't think that's why I don't think Masteron is good as hormone replacement. Let's go to our Instagram question. Again, if you're not following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. Let's go to IFBB tenacity. Dave, can you explain body recomposition and how to accomplish it? Body recomposition. Well, I would I would assume that means putting muscle on, losing fat. I, I, I don't know what, what else would define body recomposition. Recomposition means replacing one thing with another thing. 
and I'm assuming you don't want to get fatter and lose muscle, you want to add muscle and lose gain fat. You got to eat a high protein diet, you got to weight train, you know, you got to eat, you know, enough essential fats, and you got to sleep enough, that's all, and keep your carbs moderate so that you don't get fat. That's the way you, recom- you know, recompose your body, you build muscle, you lose body fat that way. Now, I want to say one thing, you know, we, we get all these great questions on our RX Muscle Instagram, and we have a lot of followers. What, I don't even know what we're up to, Sid. What are we up to? 190,000, something like that? Some, something like that. I have all these questions all right. selected. I don't want to go, but yeah. You guys love all this free information I give you all the time. All right, if you're, if you're a, a watcher of the show, okay, and you love the questions and answers, and you haven't, you know, subscribed to the RX Muscle YouTube channel, or you haven't followed us on Instagram, give us a hit. Follow us, click that button, show me some love. If I see a huge surge, and in, in for me just saying this right now, I'm going to know you guys are listening, and then I'm going to want to even do more of this. So hit us up. Interesting one here from R&B List, Dave. I, I know you've discussed this in the past. Um, it's about Chris Bumstead. Even with the kidney issue, can Chris Bumstead keep winning, keep competing as Class of Physical Olympia Championship and he says for 10 more years, and it's interesting because when you first saw him take the Olympia stage during pre-judging, you said exactly that, that Chris Bumstead has a look of someone who could win this division for the next 10 years. So again, can he do that with his kidney issues, in your opinion? You know, I don't know what the status is of his, you know, IgA, whatever he's got, um, immunoglo- immune, his immuno issues he's got. And uh, I don't know what the progression of it is. I don't know if it's stable right now. I would assume it is because he looked really good at the Olympia. Uh, if it's getting worse or better, you know, I think I, I think Chris really loves competing and, and doing this whole thing that he's doing. And now that he's Olympia champ, I, I suspect he would probably push it as long as he possibly can, probably beyond what the doctors would recommend. But he's young. He's got youth on his side right now, so that's good. So I think he could certainly win another couple of years. Uh, it's not going to be his, his disease that, that's going to beat him at this point. He's got a guy by the name of Breon Ansley and a whole bunch of other heavy hitters who are gunning for him. And it's, that's a close division. He's not miles ahead of everyone else. He's you know, a flip of a coin ahead of Breon Ansley at best. And there's other guys that are you know, chomping at the bit right behind them. So I think that Chris's health, as long as, it, as, long as you know, he said it himself, when he runs himself down, when he was going out partying too much, the disease would kick in more and, and kick his butt. When he's very militant, which I think he's going to be now as the defending champion, you know, really focusing on bodybuilding, getting enough rest, training, eating right, I think, I think he's going to keep that disease at bay, and I think, I think we'll see a lot of him. And I think we're going to see, uh, I don't think he's going to be gone anytime soon in terms of from the sport. Uh, I don't know, but once again, every, I think the progression of that disease, from what I've read, at least or I learned in medical school, it's different for everyone. So, once again, if you don't take care of yourself, it's going to run you down quicker and it's going to wreak havoc on your body more. If you give your body, if you treat it like a temple and you really you know, focus on your health, I think you can live with that you know, and not have any negative health ramifications for a very long time. <laughs> so this next question, somebody actually sent it to me over uh, DM. And it's funny because I feel like this is a question that a lot of Wives and girlfriends have asked us over the last few years. Yeah. So it's from uh, the Nora Adawi. Dave, why is my husband so obsessed with you and your videos? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the same reason that when, I, when I'm sitting watching TV, I'm watching snake videos. You know, I can't watch bodybuilding. When, I, when I'm relaxing, I can't watch anything because then what happens is my head starts spinning and I start getting ideas and calling Sid and 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 planning a next show. So I don't watch any bodybuilding when I'm like I, I, when I'm relaxing. When I relax, I usually do some you know other hobbies. I'll watch you know fish tanks and and reptile stuff, and I might you know watch some movies or whatever. So you know, I'm sure my kids are always like, why is he watching all these snake videos all the time? Well, because that's what I enjoy doing. People, you know, if you want to learn about bodybuilding and you want to get immersed in the sport and become the best that you can be, you have to find reliable sources of information. And thank, thank the Lord that people really, you know, respect what we do here at RX Muscle as being reliable. Because there's a lot of people out there putting out, I, look, I see these, people send me links all the time to these in, people's Instagrams. And a lot of these guys, you know, portray themselves as being, you know, these false prophets that know everything about there is to know about bodybuilding because they're selling drugs or they're, or they have an agenda. They're selling a supplement or they just want to try to make money for themselves. And, you know, people who are new to sport don't know if they should listen to these people. And, and I think we're kind of like a stable mainstay. People say, you know what, 
everything they say over there that Dave's going to say, at least I know is the truth. And if I want to go explore other people's ideas, that's fine. But I can always go back to Dave and get the, the bottom line. And so that's why, especially a show like Ask Dave is so important because we kind of dispel all the rumors. We, we cut through the crap and we give you it, you know, we dish it out straight. And, and this is, you know, from, and I don't, when I give advice or when I tell you my opinion on something, it's, it's always science based. And I'll always give you the reason why. I'll never say, do this because I say I am the master. No, I'm not any, I'm just a guy who reads fucking a lot of books and, and uh, websites and went to a lot of school and spent a lot of money on my education. So I just want to, you know, I want to get cut through the bullshit because I know when I was coming up, I didn't want to make all those mistakes as well. So, you know, if your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever, is into into this sport and they want to be the best they can be, the best thing they can do is be focused on a site like ours and educating themselves about what's going on. And it's not just about the science of the sport and how to, you know, eat right and how to take, you know, the right supplements and stuff like that. It's good to know the history of the sport. And that's why I do interviews like with John Hansen and we talk about the historical significance of the Arnold versus Sergio era. We do iron debate and we debate topics that are hot in the bodybuilding world because you want to immerse yourself in the, in the entire subculture of what you're doing so that when you're up there, you are well-rounded and you feel like you are a part of this thing that we've created and that it's constantly expanding and getting bigger and better. If you only just step into the into the water and you only know how to get in shape and you really don't you, you don't feel like you belong. So when you when you watch shows like this and you listen to podcasts and radio shows, it makes you feel like you're a part of what you're doing, and that's why we all listen to these shows. And look, I, I listen to other bodybuilders as well, and I watch you know I, I have the guys that I, I find amusing and stuff like that. But the truth of the matter is, when I'm interested in someone, I, I get them on my show and I interview. <laughs> That's what I learn about. I'm lazy. I do it the lazy way because I think I might as well get some content for our site while we're doing it and that, while I'm learning about these guys. And, you know, we've had some real characters on. And, and every year, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Matter of fact, I'm going to be interviewing later today uh, Clarence Bass. And if any of you guys had re read the bodybuilding magazines back in the 80s and 90s, he always had that column ripped. And he, they showed his abs. He never was huge, but he always had the shredded abs. And the guy's been doing it for like 60 years he's been competing. He's 82 now. The guy still has shredded abs better than anyone I've seen. So I, I wanted to learn where he was. Someone gave me his contact. I got him on, and we're going we're gonna to get him on the TV show. I mean, that, that's, to me, interesting. I want to know where our sport came from. So speaking of characters, Gareth MCG wants to know, your first thoughts when you first met Lee Priest and Greg Valentino. So if you want to expand a little bit about where, how, and what that yeah. initial interactions were like. I don't remember where. I believe I met Greg for the first time at Bob Bonham's gym, Strong and Shapely gym in Jersey. People had told me about Greg, and I knew who he was because, you know, he was – during. we were all running in the same circles back in the 90s. I, just, I never saw him because he was upstate – New York, and I was on Long Island at the time. I wasn't living in Westchester anymore, but I, we knew who he was. So when I ran into him, you know, we were like, we kind of knew each other, but we didn't really know each other, and I, and I was fine with him. I really got to know Greg better when I was up with Muscular Development Magazine because he wrote a column there, and we would hang out at like the Arnold Classic or the Olympia. He would come usually, and you know, I hit it off immediately with him because we have the same kind of you know personality. We we like the same things. We're both Italian and stuff like that, so we have a, a similar background. So that. I always got along with Greg, and he has a very good sense of humor, and so do I, and so that, that worked well. So I kind of knew him after my bodybuilding career. He knew me while I was competing from Bob, because I used to go to Bob's gym a lot and train, and so Bob would tell him, Dave, this freaky guy's here, and stuff like that. So, And then Bob would tell me when Greg started doing that crazy, when he was blowing his arms up, Bob would show me pictures. you got to see Greg's arms. They're like 25 inches. <laughs> and, you know, So I knew of him, but I wasn't really friends with him back then. Now, Lee Priest, I didn't really, I met him at, at Gold's Venice once, but I don't, I don't think he really, uh, I don't know if he remembered meeting me or not, you know. And I remember seeing him, you know, training there, and I was like, this guy's a freak. And I think I saw him training at World Gym out there once, too. But I didn't really start talking to him on a regular basis until I started working for Muscular Development, because he was on the contract with them, and when I took over as editor-in-chief and started their website... You know, we would interview him a lot. So I would, I would get him on the radio show. I would always interview him at shows, and so that's how we kind of became friends and, and got that friendship going. And once again, he has a really good sense of humor, and so did I. And we don't take ourselves that seriously, so we we kind of connected on that level. 
And then after, you know, I stopped competing, I, you know, and then Lee went through all his craziness with, you know, getting kicked out. And I said, you know what, Lee's such a good, I, I just like the guy and I wanted to get him back into the fray. And so I, that's why I kind of contacted him. I said, hey, well, you want to do an interview? Why don't we just kind of like try to, you know, squash the, you know, all the, all the little, you know, arguments and things that are not going, you know, right between you and, and the organization and let's just let it, put it behind us. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And so that's what we did. And I'm, I'm happy because I really, I enjoy, once again, Lee is on our show every week on Iron Rage, but I enjoy that, that hour I get to talk to him every week because, you know, we're all busy. We don't have a lot of time, you know, to hang out. Lee lives in Australia, but in its essence, I get an hour every week with him to hang out with him and just, just laugh our asses off. So for me, you know, and, and I'm sure for Lee as well, it, it's like we are friends on a regular basis. We get to hang out every week. And not, a lot of friends don't even get to spend that much time with each other. Most people just text each other all day. And I text Lee, but it's nice to be able to talk face-to-face -to -face with him. And I think that's why people enjoy Iron Rage. Let's go to Callaghan in beast mode. Lower body always holds water and body fat until the last second when getting ready for a show. Genetics or hormone imbalance? If hormones, how do you help correct the imbalance? I think it's genetically... It's a genetic issue, but it's I think it's it's hormonally you know driven. So some guys just hold a lot of, are just very estrogenic in their body, and estrogen usually is what causes fluid retention you know in that lower body. That's why women hold a lot of body fat and and, and water in their glutes and uh, hips and thighs. The guys that produce a lot of estrogen, meaning they aromatize a lot, tend to be like that. Guys also who were maybe were fatter as kids and have more fat cells in their body per se, which is where a lot of that aromatization occurs, the conversion to estrogen, have that same trouble area. I, you know, my glutes used to come in before my back would, so I never had that. And I, I'm a very low estrogenic person, and it's probably because I don't have a lot of body fat. The more body fat you carry, the more estrogen you produce. That's just what I've seen. Very rarely Let's do I see a guy who is fatter yet who doesn't produce a lot of estrogen. It's, it, there's a definite cause and effect. But I think that's got a genetic component to it. So what do you do? You gotta make sure you, you keep your estrogen levels lower. And how do you do that? You take aromatase inhibitors. Maybe you need even an estrogen receptor blocker at the very end to tighten you up as well, like a Nolvidex. And that's on an individual by individual basis. You know, uh, some guys, you know, and it's, it's very rare that, it, that you have a person that is that estrogenic. But when you do, you have to identify it and then attack it, okay? For most people taking, you know, a milligram of Ariminex, you know, every day is more than enough at the end to get them as dry as possible. But for other people, they need more. Uh, not necessarily more of that drug, but more of other aspects. And they need to be stay leaner maybe in the off-season so they don't build up as much estrogen as well. Let's go to Alpha Blade Gym. Dave, I have a lagging chest. How do I add thickness to my chest? Most people's pec muscles, okay, are deficient up here, high. In other words, they're lacking that girthiness right here, and they're usually pretty good here. They're not good here. So what I did was, at some point in my career, when I realized that was the case with my chest, now, one of the things that confuses people a lot of times is they, they have gyno here. They have, like, breast tissue here, and it hangs a little bit, and they think that they have a weak lower chest when, in fact, it's just glands that are there. That very, I've never seen a person with a weak lower chest and, and, and great upper chest. Doesn't happen. So what I did was I stopped worrying about lower chest and mid chest. So everything I did was incline work. I would do incline barbell presses, incline dumbbell presses, incline hammer presses, and, and incline flies. And I didn't worry about my mid chest. Once a month I would bet flat bench press. That was it. Uh, every other time, everything else was all incline work. And what I found was it built... My, my muscle up here by my, my clavicle, and it thickened everything up to the point you couldn't even see my clavicle. My chest was almost hitting my chin. And that's, that's what, the look that you want. That shows girth, it shows you know, development, and it shows, uh, you know, it's a good look to the judges when those pecs just kind of hang up there. Guys with big, huge lower pecs and a flat upper chest, it just, it's not appealing from a, I guess you could say, bodybuilding point of view you know what you see that in a lot is you ever see these power lifters that, that bench press guys they get these huge lower pecs you know because that that's what they're doing that's the movement they're doing the flat bench press and their upper chest is, is a lot of times not as developed 
and they don't care because they, they just want to be able to push a lot of weight. So for bodybuilding purposes, try to stick and target your, your training to incline presses. And the, the, the important thing is that the incline should not be too steep because if it's too steep, you're going to work front delts. You want to keep it as, I almost keep it at the lowest rung on the bench. So if I'm on a flat, if I'm on a bench, an adjustable bench, rather than going flat, I'll go one notch up. It might be 30 degrees. That's all you need is a little bit of lift to get to that upper chest. Let's go to Cameron Coates. Dave, the methodology behind the two to one ratio uh, test to DECA, tried both a 300 MG together consistently, have never had any sides. Is it just some people need higher tests to offset potential prolactin sides? I just think that testosterone should always be higher. I, we've had this debate before. You know, guys out there left, they, these guys that just want to take all DECA, okay? Testosterone, and we mentioned it earlier, is a perfectly balanced one-to-one -one androgenic to anabolic, you know, component. Okay, meaning that the, the muscle building drive and the androgenic or aggression side are equal. So you get the most bang for your buck. Once you got that, that's your muscle building hormone. Adding an anabolic that doesn't have as much androgen comp component is going to augment that muscle building aspect of the testosterone. Okay, And that's what you want to do. That's what you're looking for when you take Decker and test or, or Equipoise and test. Uh, or Masteron and test, or Winstrel and test. Whatever you combine testosterone with, you're just adding another anabolic component to it. Because the testosterone is already taking care of the androgen component. So if you're taking 600 milligrams a week of testosterone and 300 deca, you're going to get a nice response from that. If you do 600 deca and 300 tests, your, 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 your androgenic drive is lower, okay? And you have a lot of anabolic around, but the androgen component is, is, is watered down. So you lose some of the aggression, you lose some of the glycogen storing effects of, of the androgen, um, the strength effects, and you don't feel as good. So that's why I always tell people use, you know, 1,000 milligrams of test, use 500, you know, milligrams, 600 milligrams of an anabolic with it. Now the only thing that, that, that kind of defies that logic is trenbolone. Trenbolone is a weird compound because it's very anabolic, but not as anabolic as testosterone, but it's four times more androgenic than testosterone but it doesn't aromatize. So it's a weird, weird compound, and it works really well. They augment testosterone, but because the androgen component is so high and it's adding on top of the testosterone, you have side effects. High blood pressure, you can't sleep at night a lot of times, some people's digestive system gets all messed up, they get the hiccups, because it's overstimulating the nervous system. Okay, so that's why you don't do Trembolone for, for 20 weeks in a row. You'll go out of your mind. You know, you'll probably wind up beating someone up in the middle of the street, <laughs> okay? But the an anabolic and, and combined with the testosterone on, on every other drug, if you do two to one or close to that ratio, you're going to get the best effects. Interesting one here from CX Riso. How would you approach, and obviously everybody's different, but in your general methodology, how would you approach a 20-week prep? I want to start by dropping 10% caloric intake then 5% every two weeks and adding cardio when needed, or is 20 weeks too long? I'm concerned about my body adapting to the nutrition and it being nullified. Now, you know, 20, I, when I did a show in, uh, I think it was 94, I was gonna do the Metropolitan Championships in New York. And it was usually, it was always in February, like the second week in February. So I started my diet 16 weeks before that. They changed the date to April. So I had, a, I had a diet, literally, an extra six or eight weeks. But what I did was I, I had such a gradual, slow diet that I took my time losing the weight that I wasn't really that calorically low initially, okay, until I got to six weeks out. And then I, if I had to pull the trigger a little bit, I pulled the trigger. So I just did a more gradual diet. You can diet for a long time, and as long, especially if you're having a cheat meal once a week, it's not a big deal. It's very, you have to, it's very disciplined, but you could eat more food that way. You know, so when, if I have a guy come to me and say, I, I, I got a lot of weight to lose, Dave, I want to do a 20 week diet, no problem. We start off and, as, and I make sure that they're losing the right amount of weight so in my mind that they're going to be in shape in 20 weeks. Um, if they came to me with 12 weeks to go and say I need to be in shape, I might have to speed that process up, right? I mean, I don't reduce food unless I absolutely have to. That's the last variable I change. So I don't worry about calories. I figure out how much protein, fat, and carbs they need I give them that, and I see how their bodies respond. 
If they're losing weight consistently, great. If they get stuck, I might give them a little more cardio. If that doesn't undo it, and I, I'll try to give them some more fat burn. If that doesn't, you know, get them past that sticking point, then I reduce food. You know, and it's usually you don't have to really reduce food in a person's diet until they've actually dropped a significant amount of weight. If someone goes from losing 15 pounds in six weeks, okay, they probably don't need as much food, but they might. They might. You have to see how their bodies respond. I've, I've worked with people. I never changed the diet the whole entire diet. Never. I've changed the, the days. A lot of times I'll do high, higher carb days and zero carb days, but I might switch those ratios around. But I've done a lot of people I work with, I never take any food out of their diet. They're, they get nervous. They're like, you, you haven't changed my diet. I'm like, well, why should I? You're losing weight. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, I mean, you want to keep, if you keep more food in there and, and lose weight on more food, that's the best, that's the best outcome you can hope for. Let's go to South D Champ. Do you give much attention to body types, uh, endomorphic, ectomorphic, mesomorphic when considering diet or training plans? Yeah, I mean, you, you, I don't know if I actually lay it out in my mind, I mean, on, on paper like that, but I guess in my mind I evaluate it. I, you know, and usually people will tell you, in other words, if, I, if people send me their, you know, their info saying, hey, this is what I want to accomplish, here's my goals, I tend to be a hard gainer or a hard loser or... And I can look at their body and see usually if they're bulky looking or if they're just, you know, they're relatively on the leaner side, you know, just to start with. I know if they're going to be a hard gain. And, and once again, once I start them on a diet, I'll know how their bodies respond right away, you know. I've worked, <laughs> I've put people on contest diets and they start, and they're gaining weight for the first three, four weeks. And they're freaking out. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on, you know. But then I find out they weren't eating enough protein. And so they're actually gaining muscle. Then there's other people I put on contest diet and they're gaining weight and it's because I'm just giving them too much food, you know, and I got to take away food. That's all. I, I overestimated how good their metabolism was. So it's a trial and error process. That's why as a coach, it's good because you have this unlimited relationship with the person you're developing where, you know, if I need to get an update every day from someone, I ask them for an update every day. If I only need one once a week, you know, because we're hitting a good stride and they're losing every week, then I, I might only have one once a week. But I have the ability to say, hey, you know what? You, you were traveling yesterday. You were sitting in a car for 12 hours. You, you haven't gone to the bathroom in, in, in 36 hours. You haven't pooped at all. This is ridiculous, this update you're giving me. It's not, it's not accurate. You know what? Tomorrow, give me an update after you go to the bathroom. Then they, go, <laughs> they wake up in the morning, they poop five pounds out of their body, and then, and then I get an accurate update from them. So that you got to kind of just go with the flow and see how their body responds. That's what a good coach does. It's like you're on the, it's on the, you're on the run improvising, you know, as you see how their body responds. Let's go to Joe K 90. Not sure if you've addressed this one in a previous episode. Have you ever had an infection from an injection? If so, what is a good antibiotic to have on hand just in case? Throughout the history of my, of my bodybuilding career, I've had many infections. Not, not, I mean, I guess I, I competed for about 13 years, so maybe I had five infections during that time, okay? Every single time I try to listen to a doctor and, and, and take what they prescribed to me and went against my better judgment, I always regretted it. And I always wound up going back to Old Faithful. And Old Faithful for me was augmented. And it was originally prescribed to me by my friend who's a dermatologist bodybuilder. And he said that augmented is great for skin bacteria, you know, and he was a dermatologist that he knew. And he was right. It always cured every infection because it, it's, it's amoxicillin, but it's amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. And what clavulanic acid does is it, it prevents the bacteria, okay, from getting uh, acclimated or, or being immune to the antibiotic. A lot of times these, what happens is these antibiotics, okay, kill off 98% of the bacteria, but 2% of them mutate and then they become immune to it. The, it seems like augmenting, it, it's almost 0% chance that the bacteria will become immune to it, so it always works. As, you know, and it will work if the bacteria are susceptible to amoxicillin, of course. If it's a different type of bacteria that, that is you know, gram-negative and it's not responsive, then, then you obviously have to use something else. But usually skin bacteria are very responsive. As a matter of fact, when I would break out a lot, okay, uh, especially like the week or two before a show, I would take augmenting just to clear my skin up you know, from acne, and it worked really well for that. Now, the, there was a time where I, I got an infection in my leg, and I, and I think I banged my shin or something like that at the gym. And for some reason, I, I had so much, I, I had like black and blue, and it was, there was a lot of stagnation in the blood there, and I got an infection. Never even, no shot, nothing. It was just from banging my shin really hard in the gym. 
got an infection, and I was on augmented. It wasn't doing anything. It was getting worse. I was panicking now because I'm like, oh boy, here, here we go. I'm going to wind up in the hospital. And, I, and they put me, they actually prescribed this doctor an, uh, an injectable antibiotic. It was like a, one of these cephalosporins. And I, I was taking a lot of it. I, would go, I had to go to a special pharmacy to pick it up, and I took a shot. I mixed it up, and I took a shot of it, you know. And it, wasn't, it still wasn't working that well. And then I said to myself, you know what? I think the reason I originally got the infection and the reason why I'm not responding to these antibiotics is that there's too much pooling in my legs, the, the, the stagnation down there. So I went out and I bought a, um, one of those pressure stockings, you know, that they, they have old people wear. You can buy them at CVS, except I didn't buy the white one. I bought a black one so I'd look cool. And I put it on and I wore it all the time. And what it does is it, it, it compressed my leg and all that stagnation down there was allowed to be pushed back to my heart and, and improved the circulation down there. And what I found was the infection went away in like, in like a week after that was gone. So now whenever I tell people, when I see people get injured or, or, or get an infection in their lower legs, because especially in bodybuildings, sometimes your circulation is not so good down there. It, it's a good idea to go get a pressure stocking or something like that that's going to help, once again, reduce the fluid, uh, the fluid uh, that's going on down there and the edema in there and allow circulation to improve so that the antibiotic can get there. So to answer your question, I think Augmentin is the best one to go with. Usually you use, it's 875 milligrams, but then when they add the clav, with the clavulonic acid, it's, it's considered a thousand milligram pill, and it's usually taken twice a day for anywhere from seven to 14 days, depending on how bad the infection is. Never take it less than seven days. Uh, always finish your, your antibiotic out, even if the infection looks like it's gone, because you wanna make sure you get rid of everything. That's my suggestion, and once again, I've, I've probably suggested it to a thousand people over the years, and everyone who's used it, it always works. Time for a couple of more questions. Uh, I know we're pushing the clock really hard, but I wanted to get a couple of these in. Uh, I am that someone else. This is a good question because I feel like, you know, Dave, when you talk about your philosophies, I think it is good to clarify sometimes. What is the best for gains? Go off gear and stay on your around. You have said receptors are rebooted when off gear and that it's important to gain size. You have also said staying on year round is the best for gains. So what is it? No, I, I said that you should stay on for a full season, meaning that you do your off season cycle. You go right into your pre-contest cycle. You do your show. After the show is over, you come immediately off. You do your PCT, your HCG, Clomid and you stay off for a good nine weeks, 10 weeks, okay? And then you repeat the cycle. So it's a yearly cycle. So it's like an, uh, it's like almost like an eight and a half, nine months on, like three months off type of thing for the whole year, especially if you're competing every year. If you're not competing for the year, you can actually probably do cycle off, you know, for six weeks, cycle, and then do your eight weeks off. You can come off twice. But if, you, if you're competing in a calendar year, you know, if I'm competing in, uh, in the uh, North America Championships in September, and I start my and I'm off the months of November and December. I'm going to start my cycle January 1st. I'm going to stay on January 1st to September, and then I'm going to go off and do my off cycle. And that's how I have the guys I work with who are competing at, at a high level. You know, people who are not necessarily competing and just are doing this just to build muscle and look good, and they're not ready to get on stage. You could do you could do you know a cycle off a cycle off in in, in the course of a year. I did nothing wrong with that. That's what I did earlier in my career. But once I got into that, you know, that that com competition thing, and I was guest posing in the off season, it was it, it behooves me to be on. But you got when you go off, there's no bridging. There's no taking a little bit of this and that. You go off completely. Let those receptors regenerate. Let your body detoxify itself and and get your health back. Get the receptivity of the receptor, the androgen receptors back, and then start up again. And you will see great gains. I promise you. If you stay on consistently all year round, even a low dose of, of HRT, 200 milligrams a week, you're never gonna truly recover. You might detoxify yourself, but you're never gonna re regenerate those receptors. Um, I'm only gonna ask this, or rather, I'd rather have you have this an answer this question only if this is not something you've answered recently. And I feel like you may have, but clarify if I'm wrong. It's from Get Strong and Big 509. Your very first cycle, and what were the results? Is this something you answered recently or not? I just answered it today. I said I did a Primavol and a Winchell cycle. I did 100 milligrams of Primavol two times a week. 
believe it, believe it or not, and I did 50 milligrams of Winchell three times a week, um, injectable. And I did that for, I think, eight or 10 weeks. I can't remember exactly how many weeks it was. And so I put on about 15 pounds, and I would say about 11, 10 or 11 of those were, were muscle. And I, I felt good. I don't think any, I didn't, wasn't excessively bloated. I didn't get huge, but I got bigger. And, I, and, it, and it was noticeable to people in the gym because I was more pumped and I was veiny. But I wasn't, I wasn't that big then. I was probably like two, I probably went from like 220 maybe to 235. But that's a big jump, you know, for, to do it in, in two or three months. So, and when I stopped the drugs, I did no PCT because it was unnecessary because I wasn't really suppressing my body's natural production. And, and I held most of the size gains, if not all of them. So it worked really well. And that's why I always told people there's no reason to do heavy drugs as a first cycle because you're going to grow from anything you do. Trying to find this one question. Now, you spoke with, you've had a, oh, here it is. Uh, Ed Connors, obviously you've had a, a series of interviews with him, uh, including Arnie List as well, talking about some of the old school uh, Gold's Gym stories. Now, I don't know if these comments were made with you or elsewhere, and if you want to verify whether or not Ed Connors said this in fact. It's from Mel and Fit. He goes, Dave, Ed Connors said Synthol killed Nasser and Matt Duvall. Is there any truth to that? And if so... How and why was it the reason for their passing? Do you remember him making these comments, and uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I definitely made those comments. I've heard him say it more than once, actually, too. I don't believe that's the truth. I, I, you know, Matt Duvall had some other problems, and that had nothing to do with synthol, okay, in terms of his death. And, uh, you know, Nasser had kidney failure, so that wasn't due to synthol. So, you know, I think that what Ed meant was that they were using too much of it and he felt that it might have distorted their physique. We know Nasser had those big lumps on his rear delts and Matt had a lot of suspicious body parts too, you know, that were blown up with them. But I don't think they killed him. I think the bodybuilding lifestyle killed those guys. I think if they, were, if they had left the bodybuilding lifestyle or they had segued out of it at a certain point, I think they would still be alive. But, but I think, I don't even think bodybuilding killed Matt. I think Matt had just some other issues that, that were the problem. And I don't want to talk to that. Uh, I was going to get Matt's brother on. He had contacted me at one point. Maybe we will, and we'll we'll get a more in depth, you know, look into Matt's life behind the scenes. I only knew the Matt, you know, that I knew that he portrayed to me. Um, but obviously, there was more to Matt that we really didn't know. And, and that would be a, a nice interview to do down the road. I think Nasser was just so consumed with with regaining that look that he had when he should have won the Olympia in '97, and he just pushed the envelope too far for too long. And then when he got sick, I think he got angry at the bodybuilding world, even though he should have been angry at himself because no one made him do that. And I think that that's where that anger and that, that resentment and that kind of like, you know, bad taste in his mouth came from at the end. And it's unfortunate because he had a lot to share. He's a smart guy. And I wish he was still around, even though he was a pain in the ass. I, I, I would have loved to have him on all this TV program. I mean, he would have been awesome. So in essence, I think bodybuilding killed Nasser um, because he just he couldn't he couldn't leave it. He couldn't, he couldn't stop. He, he, he w thought he had one last show in him. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And I think that he never said, hey, there's life after bodybuilding. I'm a smart guy. I can do anything I want. I've already achieved everything I needed to achieve. Do we have time for one more or is sure. Tyler going to Go for it, man. <laughs> uh, Coleman Luke is only because we get a lot of questions about what supplements best for this, best for that. Best supplements to improve insulin sensitivity. Fish oil products. Matter of fact, and I'm gonna I'm gonna plug my product. I sometimes plug my product. Sometimes I have a product Omega Lives. It's probably my number one selling product now. We can't it, it's we can't keep it in stock because people finally realize how good it is. Not just from the sense of providing your essential omega threes coming from fish oil and your omega sixes coming from even the primrose oil. And I believe I'm the only one who combines those two in the same formula. And in a potent dosage, you know, three grams of fish oil and 2,600 milligrams of primrose. But I also have another ingredient in there, palmitoleic acid, which is an omega-7 fat, which happens to be a terrific insulin sensitizer, okay, and reducer of C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker in the body. So the fish oil is an insulin sensitizer, okay, and the palmitoleic acid is a really good insulin sensitizer as well. Those seem to increase insulin receptors 
and density tremendously. And there's a ton of research to show that out there, okay? Um, so for me, you know, it's, it's like the all-purpose supplement that everyone, that's why when people say to me, what supplements should people take? I'm like, well, there's really two that you should absolutely take. And I have to make both of them. And the reason I made both of them is because this is what I knew the body needed. One was V-mineralized, which is your vitamins and minerals and, and, and fruit and vegetable extracts in one product in high dosages. And that's why you got to take 10 pills a day. And the other is your essential fats. So if you take your vitamins and minerals and, and, and um, uh, fruit extra and vegetable extracts, and then you take your essential fats, You've got everything covered. The only thing else you need is a fiber supplement, okay? Those three things, okay, cover what you need daily in addition to the food you eat, okay? Everything else is what we call a luxury item, or what I call a luxury item, because that means you can take it or leave it. Protein supplements are awesome because it makes it easier to eat enough protein, but you can eat food, okay? You can't eat enough food to get the vitamins, minerals, and essential fats that you need. It would be impossible. Okay, so that's why we take supplements, and that's why those three particular supplements happen to be absolute necessities. There's no, there's no either or, maybe, should I? Do those if you want to get the best results. If you want good insulin sensitivity, you've got to take these essential fish oils and, and or palmitoleic acid. Once again, I put it into one formula to make people's life easy, but that's the best insulin sensitizers out there. Truth be told, the best insulin sensitizer that doesn't include anything you can pop in your mouth would be exercise. When, when you work out, when I stopped working out for a while because I was having all these kids and I just had no time, my, my fasting blood sugars in the morning were running high. And I couldn't figure out why because I never had high blood sugars before. And when I'm talking high, I'm talking, they were still under 100, but they were at like, you know, high 90s. And I started working out again at night before, you know, at 11 o'clock, you know, when my kids go to sleep. And my blood sugars all came back to normal. So exercise creates insulin sensitivity, okay? And you don't have to do cardio for it. We're talking weight training. You do a session of weight training and watch your blood sugar go down. I've gone and eaten a huge meal. My blood sugar was, you know, up around 135, 140, which is what it should be after a big crazy meal. I go and work out and come back. It's in the 90s. So that's because exercise allows your body to absorb glucose without the need for insulin, Okay by creating these GLUT4 receptors that we've talked about before. So insulin sensitivity, exercise, and essential fatty acids. And that's gonna do for this episode of Ask Dave. Special thanks, of course, Dave Palumbo and our producer, Tyler Shore. I'm Sadiq Farooqui, we'll see you next time.